All right, welcome back. So we're going to continue our discussion of smooth surfaces today. And just to recap what we already talked about, we said that we're going to describe surfaces as parameterized surfaces. In other words, we're going to think of the geometry of a shape as being described by a map F. So F is going to have a domain that's some region in the plane here. We've called that M. And what it tells us at each point of M is what is the location that it sits at in three-dimensional space, okay? And so that's very much like our notion of a parameterized curve, except now the domain is two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. Another important object that we can associate with this parameterized surface is its differential, which we're gonna write as DF. And the key idea here is that the differential of a parameterized surface takes a tangent vector here, X, and it pushes it forward onto the surface. So really, if you imagine that this tangent vector was a little arrow drawn with an ink pen on the domain, and now this domain is a piece of rubber that gets stretched out into space, then df of x is just telling you where did that arrow end up in space? What direction does it point? Okay, and we're gonna call that the push forward of a tangent vector. Why do we want to talk about the differential? Well, one very good reason is it lets us talk about what it means for a surface to be nice. So if you remember when we talked about curves in the plane, we said a curve is nice if it's regular, if its derivative never goes to zero. And the idea of an immersed surface captures that same kind of idea, but for surfaces. So we say that a surface is immersed if its differential is non-degenerate. More precisely, if df of x equals zero if and only if x equals zero. This is a very natural property to ask for. If we end up with a vector that has no length, it must have been a vector that started out with no length. In other words, vectors that have some non-zero length get stretched out in some way, but they don't get squashed all the way down to zero, right? The speed of our surface never goes all the way to zero. And the reason this is such an important condition is that it lets us define other geometric quantities on the surface. It's going to be kind of the essential condition we need to make sure that at least locally the geometry of the surface is well defined. One particular quantity of interest is the induced Riemannian metric. And this really gets at this idea of working through an immersion. So what, what is the idea of the, the Riemannian metric here? It's that if we have two vectors, x, y in the domain, and we wanna talk about the inner product between those two vectors, well, we should really always remember that those vectors are gonna get stretched out in some interesting way as they go into three-dimensional space. And so to take their inner product, we shouldn't simply take the dot product of their coordinates in the plane, but what we should do is first push them forward into R3 and then take their dot product in R3. And that's what's represented by this boxed expression. G, the Riemannian metric of xy, is gonna be defined as the inner product in R3, that's what these angled brackets are, the inner product in R3 of dfx and dfy, right? So you could say that this Riemannian metric, its job is really to emulate the inner product in 3D space, but represent it in our local two-dimensional coordinates. And that's gonna be a very common trend in differential geometry, that if we want to do calculations on the surface, well, we'd like somehow to represent those calculations in the 2D plane. But whenever we do those calculations in the 2D plane, we have to account for any distortion that happens between that planar coordinate system and the actual physical surface. Okay, so once we have this immersion, once we know that we have a nice surface, what other quantities can we easily define? Well, one really important thing to talk about is the normals of the surface, and that's captured by what's called the Gauss map. Okay, so first of all, what do we mean by normals? We talked a little bit about normals for a curve, right? We said if we have a tangent to a curve, maybe in the plane, the normal is the vector that's rotated by 90 degrees. So we have some sense that the normal is a vector that sticks straight out of the curve or the surface. It's the direction you would travel to sort of leave the surface as quickly as possible. We can be a little more precise than that and say a vector is normal to a surface 
if it's orthogonal to all tangent vectors. Okay, so for all x, for all vectors x in the domain, we're going to ask that the inner product in R3 of the push forward of that vector, df of x, is orthogonal to the normal. Right, so n inner product df of x is equal to 0. We can kind of draw a picture of this that might help to say, okay, here's our domain M, here's our map F that describes our surface F of M. And if we have any tangent vectors in the plane, X and Y, we can push them forward to R3 by applying this map DF, right? So now you have DF of X and DF of Y, those are vectors in R3. And the requirement is that the normal is orthogonal to any such vectors. So here's one example normal. One critical question to ask at this point, or maybe to notice about this sort of definition is, it doesn't seem to pin down a unique definition of normal, right? Is there a unique vector n satisfying this boxed expression? Well, no, of course not, right? We could make that vector longer and shorter. That wouldn't affect the fact that it's orthogonal to all the tangent vectors. We could also flip it upside down, right? We could look at minus n, and that would still satisfy this definition, okay? So the idea of the Gauss map is to really pin down more precisely a definition of the normal, canonical definition of the normal for the surface. And so we'll say that the Gauss map is a continuous map taking each point on the surface to a unit normal vector. So there are two important things in this definition. One is that we want to really just say, why not consider just a unit direction? Right? Forget about the magnitude, it's not important. We just care about the direction. So let's imagine that n is unit at every point. Also, we're saying that as we move around on the surface, the direction of the normal shouldn't suddenly flip, right? It's a continuous assignment of normals to points on the surface. So an interesting thing about this way of thinking is that actually this Gauss map is not so different from our map F. It takes each point of the domain M and assigns it a unit vector which we can think of as a point in three-dimensional space. So another way of saying that is N is itself another kind of surface. It's just a surface that naturally arises from our initial surface F. In other words, when you go out into the world and you look at any surface, there's this kind of hidden surface sitting right there, which is the normals of the surface as well. And in many cases, thinking about the Gauss map as another surface of this kind, visualizing it as a piece of the unit sphere is going to be very, very uh, helpful for understanding the way surfaces work, especially when we start talking about curvature, which we'll do in an upcoming lecture. One really important question to ask at this point is, does the Gauss map always exist? We said the Gauss map is a continuous map taking each point on the surface to a unit normal vector. Well, can we always find this continuous map? What do you think? So actually, as it turns out, there are some surfaces where we're going to have trouble continuously assigning a definition of normal. If we have a surface like this band on the left, just this piece of a cylinder, okay, maybe no problem. We can have the normals all sticking out or all sticking in, really just taking the normals of a circle and kind of extruding them in the vertical direction. But if we have something like this Mobius band, what you can imagine is, okay, we start out at some point, we assign a normal, we pick a direction, up or down, and then we walk around a loop on the surface. And when we get back around on this very interesting surface, what's going to happen is the normal that was sticking up by the time we get back around is now going to be sticking down, right? And so then to continue and make a second tour around this loop, the normal has to suddenly flip. We don't have a continuous map from the surface to the unit sphere, okay? So 
the Gauss map is really something that only exists globally on orientable surfaces. You could actually use this as a way of defining what it means for a surface to be non-orientable, right? A surface is orientable only if we can assign a globally continuous Gauss map. Now, we can still, on a non-orientable surface, we can still, in any local neighborhood, in any small disk-like neighborhood, we can still assign a Gauss map. That's not a problem. But we can't do it globally. Okay? It's also helpful to think about concrete examples where we can compute the Gauss map, really get a, a feel for what this looks like. So let's look at um, our favorite example, the sphere. And our strategy for getting a unit normal is simply going to be to find two tangent directions at every point and take their cross product. We know that the cross product of two vectors is going to be orthogonal to both of them. So if we want a vector that's orthogonal to tangent vectors, we can just take the cross product of two tangent vectors. Okay, so our map F in this case is this one. F of UV is equal to cosine U sine V, sine U sine V, cosine V. And the differential of this map we get by just taking partial derivatives of each of the components of F. And we get a differential one form that has the component shown here. Now I've also written this in a way where you can kind of think about it as the Jacobian matrix or the, the sort of transpose of the Jacobian matrix, if that's more familiar to you, right? And so, so you get the idea that if I have a vector in the plane that has u and v components, then I apply the differential to this vector and I'll get a vector in three-dimensional space that has, let's say, x, y, z coordinates, okay? And one thing you may remember from our earlier lecture is that this map f is not an immersion. Why isn't it an immersion? Well, at the poles, at sort of the north and south pole, this map df fails to be injective. There's vectors that are non-zero and yet get mapped to zero. Those were the, the vectors you get by trying to change your latitude at the North Pole. So you're at the North Pole and you're trying to walk around in some direction that'll change your latitude. Well, no luck. Sorry, your longitude. I always get those two confused. You're trying to change your longitude at the North Pole, but all, you know, there's only one longitude at the North Pole. Okay, so no problem. Everywhere else, we're still gonna do a perfectly good job of computing our Gauss map. How do we do it? Well, we just see what happens if we take a cross product of two tangent vectors. We get those two tangent vectors by applying the differential to the basis vectors in the u and v direction, partial partial u and partial partial v. Those are gonna give us two vectors in three-dimensional space, and we take their cross product. And so now what we know, as long as we're not at the north and south pole, we now know that we have a vector that points in the normal direction even if it doesn't have unit magnitude. So if we want the unit normal, fine, just go ahead and divide by the length. So I've kind of sped through the calculations here. You can work these out at home if you like. But in this case, what happens is the unit normal we get is actually just going to be a constant multiple of the sphere itself. It's just going to be, in fact, minus f. Okay, and this should make some kind of intuitive sense. If we think of the sphere as being centered around the origin, which it is, then the normal direction at any point is just the vector from the origin to that point. Well, actually, just because of our sign convention and our orientation convention, it's the opposite vector. It's the vector pointing from that, from that point back in toward the origin. And so you, you notice in this picture, I've indicated the, that these arrows are not n, but rather minus n. Okay, but the, the question of whether it's going in or out, this is purely a convention. You could have picked it the other way, set up your parameterization the other way. Okay, one thing to be careful of when you're doing this kind of calculation is that the two tangent vectors that you're taking the cross product of, of course, they shouldn't be parallel, right? You really need to pick two linearly independent tangent vectors. Okay, from here we can ask some basic questions about the Gauss map. For instance, is the Gauss map surjective? In other words, 
if I give you a unit vector u, can you always find some point on the surface that has that normal, a point where n is equal to u? And just to make this more well-defined, let's say that we're talking about a closed surface, so something that has no boundaries or holes, like the sphere or the torus. And let's say it's a nice smooth surface, it's immersed, kind of as nice as you like. Right? In fact, maybe just to, to keep this simple, let's imagine also it's embedded. It doesn't self-intersect. Okay? So if we have this nice smooth surface sitting in space, can we always find some point on the surface that has the given normal u? I'll let you think about that for a second. And the answer actually is yes. And there's a very simple proof given by David Hilbert, which is to say, okay, I've got my nice closed surface in space. You hand me this vector u, you wanna find a point that has this vector as its normal. So what I'm gonna do is construct a plane whose normal is equal to u. And I'm gonna push that plane off in the distance also in the direction u. So really push it off toward infinity and now slowly bring it back in toward the surface until the first moment of contact with the surface. At this moment, the plane is tangent to the surface, and at the point of contact, the normal is therefore parallel to the given vector u. Right? And we can do this for any, any vector we like, any direction we like. We will definitely find such a point. So yes, the Gauss map is surjective. A sort of complementary question is to say, well, what about injectivity? Is the Gauss map injective? Is it ever injective? Is it always injective? So in, by injective, I mean, again, I give you this vector u, and I ask, can you find not only one, but more than one point that has this vector as its normal? Well, from this picture, we kind of see something going on that might suggest the answer is no, it's not always injective. So if we look at the bottom of this shape, we have these two bumps. And you can imagine finding a plane that is tangent to both of those bumps simultaneously. For instance, just imagine taking that shape and resting it on a table, right? The place where the shape sits on the table that is going to have more than one point of contact. And then at both of those points, I'm going to have the same normal. So I don't have this one-to-one -one mapping between vectors on the unit sphere and normal vectors on the surface. Are there examples of shapes, or let's say classes of shapes, that have an injective Gauss map? We've certainly seen one example already, which is the unit sphere, right? Just trivially, for each point on the unit sphere, there's a unique point on the unit sphere that has that normal because we said the normal is just minus the position. What about more generally? Which are the shapes that have an injective Gauss map? So I won't say too much more about this here, but what I'll claim is that it's shapes that are strictly convex. So we talked before about what it means for a shape to be convex, right? That if I take any two points inside the solid region, then the line segment connecting them doesn't leave that region. Strongly convex means, roughly speaking, it has no flat sides. So the cube would not be strongly convex where the sphere is. And I claim that these strongly convex shapes have injective Gauss maps. I'll let you think about that on your own. Another interesting quantity that, that comes up in the differential geometry of surfaces but is not kind of a familiar everyday quantity is what's called the vector area. You might have seen this in, in physics if you've studied kind of flux through surfaces. And kind of the motivating question is to say, well, let's say I have a little patch of surface, a little disk of surface floating in space. And I wanna know what's the average normal in some sense? Right? What, what, what's a vector I can associate with that patch that roughly tells me 
what the normal direction is at all the points. Well, one way to get such a vector is to just integrate the normal over the patch and divide by its area. Right? Integrate over omega n with respect to the area, dA, and divide by the area of the patch. And the integrand in this expression, n dA, is called the vector area. Right? dA, just by itself, is our area form, our area 2 form. So multiplying that by the Gauss map, or the unit normal, gives us the vector area, which is a vector valued 2 form. Right? So just, just like, what does dA do? It says, oh, if you give me some pair of tangent vectors on the surface, I'm going to assign the area to that. I'm going to assign the, the kind of an area of a little parallelogram. Well, now I'm going to assign that area times the normal at that point on the surface. Okay? Actually, if we want to understand this quantity a little, a little more uh, kind of carefully, we can connect it in a very, very nice way to the map F, or the immersion F, describing the surface. In particular, let's look at this quantity df wedge df. So we take the differential of the surface, we wedge it with itself. And remember that since we're working with vector valued differential forms, in this case, R3 valued differential forms, it's not true that df wedge df is just going to be equal to zero. And the reason is when we go to evaluate this two form on a pair of vectors, so let's say we evaluate it on x and y, we get this expression, df of x cross df of y minus df of y cross df of x. Now, for a scalar valued form, we wouldn't have a cross product here, just an ordinary product. And so these two terms would be the same and they would cancel out. But since we have the cross product, we can say, ah, well, cross product itself is anti-symmetric. So if we switch the order of the last two terms, we get minus dfx cross dfy. So minus minus that quantity gives us plus that quantity and we get two df of x cross df of y. And then we can say, ah, well, since df of x and df of y are both vectors tangent to the surface, their cross product must be in the normal direction. And their magnitude looks just like the area form applied to those vectors, right? The longer the vectors get, the bigger the quantity becomes. If the vectors become more parallel, the, the quantity becomes smaller. It just behaves like the area of a parallelogram, okay? And so in the end, what we say is that df wedge df by itself is just equal to 2nda, right? Because this, this holds for any pair of vectors x and y. And that lets us say that the area vector, which we'll call script A, is just one half df wedge df. Okay, so to take a step back here, what I'm really saying is that if you have the immersion f and you want a quantity that is sort of like the normal, just take the differential of the immersion wedged with itself, df wedge df, okay, and half that. Now that's really a two form, but pretty close to just the normal, the zero form. Okay, so by expressing vector area this way, we can make a very interesting observation, right? So if we integrate the normal over the surface, I've put a factor two in here just to make the rest of my calculation a little simpler. So if we integrate the normal over the surface that, or the surface patch, that's the same as integrating over that patch df wedge df. Okay, and I can play a little trick here and say, ah, well, I could imagine that df wedge df actually came from taking the derivative of something. If I take the derivative d of f df, well, that's going to be df wedge df uh, plus f wedge ddf, but ddf is zero. So I just get df wedge df, right? Okay, so the integral over of the normal over the surface looks like this. When you see an expression like this, what do you think? You're integrating over the surface the d of something. What is that equivalent to? What, what theorem does that remind you of? 
So hopefully if you've been paying attention so far, that should immediately have you screaming, Stokes Theorem, it's Stokes Theorem, right? That I should change this, or I can change this into a boundary integral, integrating over the boundary of omega of FDF. Okay, so, so let's pause there. That's already quite interesting. If I want to know the average or the total normal over a surface patch, I can do that by just looking at the boundary of the patch. I don't need to know anything about the shape of the patch itself. Right? And if I want to make this expression a little more concrete, a little more familiar, and kind of get some of the, the differential forms out of there, I can expand this and I can say that's the same as walking along the boundary of the patch. Right, Walking along at unit speed, so I'm kind of integrating with respect to arc length. At each point, I grab the position, f of s, and I take the cross product with the tangent to the boundary, which is... I've written here as df of t of s. I'm pushing forward the tangent vector into three-dimensional space. Kind of a funny idea. I'm going to take a cross product between the position of the boundary and the tangent on the boundary. Now, because position shows up, this sounds like this quantity shouldn't be translation invariant, right? If I move the surface around, well, f is going to change, right? If I, if I translate the surface by a constant c, I'm going to get f plus c. So... Shouldn't that show up in my integral? Well, you can convince yourself by thinking about the fact that you're going around a closed loop that this plus C term actually is gonna cancel out, okay? So we really can express the total normal over the patch as just an integral over the boundary, pretty cool. And again, what that means is if we have two different patches that have completely different geometry on the interior, but they have the same boundary curve, then the total normal or the average normal, however you want to look at it, is the same for these two patches. That's pretty cool. That's Stokes' theorem showing up once again. Right? Why is this useful? I mean, why, why are we talking about this? Well, one thing that, that is pretty cool is you can now say, well, let's say I have in the discrete setting, I have a mesh. And rather than a triangle mesh, I have a mesh made out of other kinds of polygons, quadrilaterals, pentagons, whatever you like. Now, unless you get lucky and all the vertices of that polygon are in a common plane, then there's this kind of annoying question. What is the normal vector that I should associate with that polygon? For a triangle, it's easy. A triangle always sits in a, in a single plane. You can always take the normal of that plane to be the normal of the triangle. But here on the bottom right, I have a quadrilateral, four points that don't sit in the common plane. And so which normal should I assign to that polygon. Well, this vector area, or this, this integrated vector area, gives me a really nice answer. I can just integrate around the boundary to get a canonical definition of the normal that doesn't require me to even think about how I'm filling in that polygon. You could imagine it's filled in in all sorts of different ways with some kind of smooth patch, but in terms of this definition, it, it completely doesn't matter. One other thing, one other fact I'll say about this vector area, I won't try to prove it, but just, just so you know, really cool fact, another way to think about the vector area is you take the boundary curve and you look at it from all possible directions. Or you could also think about you cast its shadow onto a plane that's oriented in all possible ways. And whichever one has the maximal area projection, the biggest shadow, that plane has a normal that's equal to this integrated vector area. Okay, so it's another nice geometric interpretation of this vector area. Another immediate uh, fact we get from studying the vector area is we know that the integral of the normal vanishes for any closed surface. It doesn't have to be a convex surface, doesn't have to be embedded, as long as it's closed, meaning it has no boundary. Why is that true? Why is the integral zero if we have no boundary? Oh, well, simply because we turned the integral of the normal over the surface into an integral over the boundary. What's the integral over the empty set? Well, it's zero. Okay, so there's your, there's your proof that the average normal of any closed surface is zero. Kind of a nice fact. 
Okay, so let's change gears now and talk a little bit about how we translate our tools from exterior calculus from the flat plane onto curved surfaces, immersed surfaces, right? So when we first studied exterior calculus, we said that we were going to do it just in the flat Euclidean case, in Euclidean RN, just to make our life simpler. We already had enough new things to figure out, um, so we just stuck to nice, simple, flat geometry. And so what I kept promising is, eventually we'll talk about how to extend that to curved spaces. Well, now we're going to do it. And one really nice thing about exterior calculus as a language for surfaces is that it really nicely splits up topology and geometry. So what I mean by that is that some of the operations that show up in exterior calculus don't really depend at all about the shape of the surface or how it's sitting in space. The wedge product and the exterior derivative in particular, their definition really doesn't change whether we're flat or we're curved or we're curved one way or another way. All of that geometry, all of that information about curvature and area and length, it's all captured purely in the Hodge star operators, the Hodge stars on differential forms of various degrees. And one way to see this in a really concrete way is to think about our discrete exterior calculus operators. This makes this really, really tangible. So for instance, the discrete D operator just used the mesh connectivity. When we defined the discrete D, all we really used was a signed incidence matrix. So something that just depends on how the vertices are connected up into edges and faces, and nothing at all about where the vertices sit in space. In contrast, our discrete Hodge stars, they were defined basically purely in terms of geometry. They were just ratios of volumes on our mesh, right? And so there the geometry is inescapable. To know what the discrete Hodge star is, we have to know how the mesh is shaped, where the vertices are in space. And in fact, the Hodge star is the only thing that's adding geometry to our discrete differential operators. Okay? So that's a story from the discrete setting, but it really captures correctly the spirit of what's going on in the smooth setting. And so to use exterior calculus on curved spaces, all we have to do is figure out what does the Hodge star look like for a curved surface. Okay? So... In particular, if we're talking about a surface immersed in three-dimensional space, we need just two pieces of data. One is the area form. The area form is a differential form that tells us how big is a given region. It's just the notion of the area measure of the surface or the area density of the surface. Okay, So that's going to let us define, if we know that, how big is each two-dimensional region, that's going to let us define the Hodge star on zero and two forms. And a nice thing about this is it has a very nice explicit expression in terms of the cross product in R3. We'll see that in a second. Okay, so that covers the Hodge star on zero and two forms for a surface in R3. We really only have zero, one, and two forms. Okay, so what other information do we need? We just need something called the complex structure. The complex structure more or less just tells us how do we rotate things by 90 degrees? What does it mean in this space to do a 90 degree rotation? And if we know that, we can define the Hodge star on one forms. If you remember in the plane, uh, the Hodge star on one forms really was just a 90 degree rotation, right? Doing a clockwise rotation of the argument to a one form is sort of equivalent to uh, applying the Hodge star to the one form itself. Okay. And again, we can nicely express this in terms of a cross product with the surface normal. We'll see that also in a second. Um, all of this data, by the way, is also determined completely by the induced metric of the surface. In other words, the induced Riemannian metric of, an, of a surface 
tells us everything we could possibly want to know about the geometry of that surface. So we could extract that directly from the Ramanian metric, but the way we're going to do it is, is a little more natural. It's a little more geometric. Another way of saying that actually is we could go the other direction. If we know the area form and the complex structure, then we can construct the Ramanian metric. And we'll see that in a second. Okay. So how about this area form? Right? How do we talk about the area of a little region of the domain? And the key picture, just like with the induced metric, is that we don't care at all about the area made by the vectors in the plane. This domain on the bottom left is really just some local coordinate system for doing calculations on our surface, but it doesn't actually represent the shape or the geometry of our surface. The shape is encoded entirely in this map F. So if we have two vectors, x and y in the plane, and we want to know what is the area of the parallelogram made by those two vectors, we shouldn't just, for instance, take their cross product. What might we do instead? Right? We want to somehow measure this area, but we want to account for the stretching by the immersion F. So how do we get this stretched out area? How might you do it? We did this already for the Riemannian metric. We said if we want to take the inner product of x and y, we sort of push those vectors forward into space, and then we take their dot product. Okay, so we're going to do something similar here. How do we get the signed area of the stretched vectors? Well, Actually, we're going to use the area vector here. So we can say df wedge df. Ah, we already said that that gives us not quite the area, but the area vector n times da. Okay, so let's, let's just write that out again. df wedge df of xy was df of x cross df of y minus df of y cross df of x. By anti-symmetry of the cross product, we can write that also as 2df of x cross df of y. Okay. And since df of x and df of y are tangent, we see that this is equal to 2nda of xy, just exactly the same calculation we did before. And why are we bringing this calculation up again? Well, it has exactly the information we want in it. We want da. We want the area to form of the surface. So to extract just da, we can sort of solve this equation for da. We can divided on both sides by two. And then we can take the inner product with the unit normal, right? Because if I take the inner product of n with n, I get just one. And so what that means is I can write dA, the area form on the surface, or the area form of any immersed surface F, as one half, the inner product of the normal of that surface, of the Gauss map, with df wedge df. That's a nice little expression. And, and in fact, um, I'll claim you can, if you want to work ahead, you can, you can do this. I'll claim that if we discretize this expression on a triangle mesh using the discrete operators we already talked about, this is actually just going to give you the area of each triangle. That's kind of cool. Okay. How do we use this area form to define our Hodge stars, right? So given this area two form DA, we can define the Hodge star on zero forms in the following way. If you give me any zero form, any scalar function phi, then applying the Hodge star is now nothing more than saying, oh, I have that same function phi times DA. So first we can check that the types are right. We went from a zero form to a two form right? Hodge star in general takes a k form to an n minus k form. In this case, k is 0, n is 2, 2 minus 0 is 2, life is good. Okay, but what does it, what does it mean, this new 2 form, phi da? It just means that it's the same as the area form of the surface, scaled by the value of the function, of the original function phi, at each point. So it's a 2 form where if I plug in 2 tangent vectors on the surface, it's going to spit out 
the area of the parallelogram made by those tangent vectors times whatever function I started out with. Importantly, it's going to be the area on the surface in R3 itself. It has nothing to do with the area in the plane. This picture at the bottom is really hopefully helpful for understanding kind of what's going on. We want to somehow be able to talk about the area of the surface using our local 2D coordinates u and v. And so because the surface gets stretched out in some way as we go from the flat plane into space, so here this disk kind of grows a bunch of bumps and you know has this kind of cube-like shape. And so what we see is that if we measure a little region of the plane, we shouldn't assign it its ordinary area, but rather some area that in this case is, um, it looks like quite a bit larger where we have these bumps or where we have the corners of the cube and smaller in other places. So dark colors correspond to small area, bright colors correspond to large area, okay? And in the only difference between DA and phi DA is we just take that same picture and at each point we scale it by this function phi, whatever function we started with. Okay, so that's how to start thinking about the Hodge star on zero forms on a curved surface. We can also go the other way. How do we get the Hodge star on two forms? Well, we just do the opposite of what we just did. We find the function that explains the given two form as a rescaling of the area form. Maybe a nicer way of saying that is if we have a two form omega on the surface, then it's Hodge dual, the corresponding zero form, is the unique zero form such that omega is equal to phi dA. Right? We just find the function phi that lets us express omega as a rescaling of dA. Otherwise, the picture is the same. Okay, so the last thing we need to do is talk about one forms, the Hodge star on one forms. And to do this, we need to define the complex structure. So again, the important idea behind the complex structure on a surface is that it tells us how to rotate tangent vectors by 90 degrees. Now, just as a small footnote, um, for n-dimensional manifolds, this is called the linear complex structure. But for surfaces, the complex structure and the linear complex structure are the same thing. So we'll just call this the complex structure, okay? Our most familiar example is that in two-dimensional space, in R2, we can rotate a vector x, y by 90 degrees by just swapping the components and negating the first one. x, y becomes minus y, x. That's a 90 degree rotation. And so if we were looking for a little two by two matrix that turned x, y into minus y, x, it would just look like this. It would exchange the components and it would negate one of them. Okay, what about for a surface in R3? How do we express a 90 degree rotation of tangent vectors? Well here, a really nice way to write this is using the unit normal n. So in particular, I can say that the complex structure on a surface, j sub f applied to a vector x behaves like this. So j is a complex structure. The little f indicates this is the complex structure that comes from the immersion f, okay? And so it has this kind of defining relationship that says, well, if we take a vector x, we rotate it by 90 degrees and we push it forward into space, that's the same as first pushing it forward into space, df of x, and then taking the cross product with the normal, n cross df of x. Let's see that in pictures, okay? So here's our setup, here's our surface, nicely immersed into space. We start out with a vector x, we push it forward onto the surface, that's df of x. How can we rotate that vector by 90 degrees? Well, we can just take the normal vector and take a cross product with the normal vector, right? We know that n cross df of x is gonna be a vector that's orthogonal, to both df of x and n. Vectors that are orthogonal to n are tangent vectors. So we get a tangent vector that's orthogonal to df of x. In other words, a 90 degree rotation of df of x, okay? And then the final step is to say, well, what's the 
what's the corresponding operation on x in the plane? We want to find a vector in the plane such that when we push it forward into R3, we get n cross df of x, right? And that's the vector we call jx or j sub f of x, right? So jx is going to be the vector such that when we push it into space, we get df of jx equals n cross df of x. And this relationship uniquely determines this map jf, right? That this should be true for all vectors x, that's enough to pin down this complex structure. Okay, One, the most important thing to notice, I've said a lot of stuff here, the most important thing to notice from this picture is that in the plane, x and jx are not orthogonal vectors in the usual sense. Notice that they don't make a 90 degree angle. It's only when they are pushed into R3 that they make this 90 degree angle, that jx or df of jx is a 90 degree rotation of df of x. Okay, that's the idea we wanna capture with the complex structure, the idea of rotating a vector by 90 degrees in R3. So hopefully you notice the trend here. Whenever we're defining objects on our surface, whether it's the Ramanian metric or the area two form or the complex structure, we don't care what's going on in the plane. We want to make all of our objects describe the geometry that's going on in R3. Okay. Um, by the way, we talked a little bit last time about conformal immersions or conformally immersed surfaces, meaning ones where the metric the induced Ramanian metric has a very nice form. It's just a rescaling of the ordinary dot product in the plane by a scalar function. Well, another way of talking about conformal immersions is to say a, an immersion is conformal if and only if 90 degree rotations in the plane are the same as 90 degree rotations on the surface. So in other words, if we're so lucky that being uh, orthogonal in the usual sense in the plane is equivalent to being orthogonal on the surface itself, then we have a conformal immersion. We have this particularly nice way of parameterizing the surface. Okay? So that's a nice picture. It's a little abstract. Suppose we actually want to go ahead and compute the linear complex structure J explicitly. Now I'll say, actually, this is something that's not, not something we do a whole lot, but just to kind of make the definition a little more uh, constructive, a little more concrete, we can do this by solving a little matrix equation. So this is also maybe helpful for just kind of seeing how each of these little objects can be represented uh, by matrices. So first, let's think about the, the cross product. If I have a vector n in R3, I can construct a matrix n hat, a three by three matrix, such that multiplying n hat with a vector u is the same as taking the cross product n cross u. And to do this, all I do is I take the three components of n and I stick them into the matrix in, in the way that you see here in this kind of anti-symmetric way, okay? Um, I can also write down the differential or I can represent the differential by the Jacobian matrix A, which is just the partial derivatives of the immersion F with respect to the, to the two coordinates, u and v. And then finally, I want to come up with an expression for the complex structure j, a little two by two matrix that tells me how do I manipulate a vector in the plane in a way that's equivalent to doing a 90 degree rotation on the surface. Okay, so to work this out, I haven't written out all the derivation here, but we simply take this defining formula, df of jx equals n cross df of x. And at each place, we replace the symbol that we've written with the appropriate matrix. So df would become a, script j would become this italic j, x is just a, a column vector with two entries, n cross becomes n hat, and df again becomes a. If we then solve that equation for j, we get the box expression, which says, the complex structure is a transpose a inverse times a transpose n hat a. Okay, so no deep meaning that you should be getting out of that expression, but if you had to compute the complex structure explicitly, that's what you would do. One thing that would be good to stop and think about is what happens when the surface is a conformal immersion? 
something should simplify here. Something in this expression should kind of cancel out or simplify in a really nice way what exactly happens there. Okay? Okay. So now that we have the complex structure on the surface, we can finally define the induced Hodge star on one forms. So remember that for a one form alpha in the plane, applying star alpha to a vector x is the same as applying, applying alpha to a 90 degree rotation of x. In other words, star alpha of x equals alpha of jx. And here I've written subscript R2 to just say, when we were talking about differential forms originally, everything was going on in the plane. Right? So that's, that's the, the picture we had before. For one forms on an immersed surface F, we instead want to apply a 90 degree rotation, not in the plane, but with respect to the surface itself, right? We really wanna be thinking about this geometry in R3. So the only thing that changes now is, well, the one form Hodge star is gonna be defined not with respect to the complex structure in the plane, JR2, but instead the complex structure of the immersed surface, JF. And so we could say star F alpha of X equals alpha JF of X. Nothing else is different, right? This idea of the one form Hodge star as a 90 degree rotation is exactly the same, but just geometrically it means we go to each point of the surface and in each tangent space, we rotate whatever vector we have X by 90 degrees by rotating around the normal. Okay, that's it. So at this point, we have everything we need to do to cal do calculus on curved surfaces. We know the zero, one, and two form Hodge star. We know that the D hasn't changed, the wedge hasn't changed. Those, those operations didn't depend on how the surface is immersed. And so we can, from here on out, do exterior calculus on curved surfaces becomes a little grungier than just doing it in RN. Often when we do calculations, we have to stick in little pieces of data, the Ramanian metric, the area form, the complex structure at just the right moment. But otherwise, all of our calculations are exactly as before. And certainly conceptually, they're the same as before. Okay. One nice way to see how all of these little pieces come together is to relate the area form and the complex structure to the Riemannian metric. So the Riemannian metric on a surface can be decomposed into an area form and a complex structure in the following way. If I have two vectors x and y and I apply the metric g of x, y, that's the same as measuring the area of x and a 90 degree rotation of y, dA of x, j, y. Okay, and you see these three key objects show up here, the metric G, the area form DA, and the complex structure J. And here, of course, I mean J sub F, and DA sub F, and G sub F, right? All these quantities coming from some immersed surface. If this expression lacks meaning for you, maybe a good thing to ask yourself is, well, can we think about this in terms of a much simpler relationship in 2D that just involves the ordinary cross product, dot product, and ordinary 90 degree rotation, right? What is this expression above really trying to say? And it's really trying to say something pretty elementary, which is that, well, in 2D, there's a simple relationship between the dot product and the cross product. If I have two vectors X and Y, the dot product of those two vectors is the same as the cross product of the first vector x with a 90 degree rotation of y. Okay, and that's all we're really trying to say with this expression above, that the natural inner product on our curved surface is the same as taking the area that we get from the first vector and a 90 degree rotation of the second vector, a sort of cross product of those two quantities. Okay. Finally, once we have this Ramanian metric, we can use it to define other quantities. We can use it, for instance, to define our sharp and flat operator, which if you remember is the way that we translate between vector fields 
and one forms. And when we initially introduced this idea of sharp and flat, we kind of said, well, this feels pretty superficial. We're not really changing the entries of our vectors. We're not changing anything quantitatively. It just feels like doing a, a matrix transpose, turning a column vector into a row vector or turning a row vector into a column vector. Well, finally, we're going to see a case where actually the sharp and flat do something interesting because we're no longer in a flat Euclidean space that doesn't have curvature. We're on this interesting curved surface. So now our flat operator is going to be defined in this way. If we have two vectors or two vector fields x and y, then x flat of y is going to be the same as the Ramanian metric g applied to x and y. It's still turning application of a one form into an inner product, but we're not just using the standard Euclidean inner product anymore. We're using the inner product that comes from the surface. Likewise, sharp is going to work this way. If we have a one form alpha and a vector field y, then g of alpha sharp y is the same as alpha of y. In other words, applying alpha to y, thinking of alpha as a linear map and applying it to y, is the same as taking the inner product of this new vector field alpha sharp with y. Right? So basically what's happening with the sharp and flat is we're sort of absorbing information about the surface into the object itself. Right? And because of this, it's no longer just a trivial transpose like we had in Euclidean RN. Right? Flat really correctly encodes the inner product on the surface. So maybe some pictures again help here. If I have two vector fields on a surface like this, these blue vectors, it would be very natural. I, I think people would say, yeah, okay, if I want to take the dot product or the inner product between these two vector fields, I should just take the, the dot product in R3. It would be really, really weird to say, ah, the right way to take the dot product on this surface is to flatten it out into the plane in some arbitrary way and then take the dot product in the plane. How does that make any sense? No, not at all, right? The, the dot product x dot y is not going to be the same as the dot product df of x dot df of y. We want the thing on the right, not the thing on the left. Okay? So likewise, if we're trying to turn x into a one form that's equivalent to performing this dot product, right? then we need to absorb this geometric information into x flat. We want a one form that behaves as it would on the curved surface, not in the plane. Okay, so then to wrap things up, we've said a bunch of useful stuff about surfaces. Our basic idea was to describe the shape of a surface by a function f that takes a region of the plane into R3. In terms of exterior calculus, we could say that this map is a R3 value differential zero form on the domain M. This is maybe a little bit of a fancy way of talking about it, but it's going to let us use exterior calculus to continue talking about surfaces in a very nice, uh, clean way. We talked about some basic properties that a, a surface could have. For instance, we say that a surface is embedded if, roughly speaking, it doesn't have self-intersections. Right? But we said we had to be a little more careful about the exact definition of embedding. The, the real concept behind an embedding is that it preserves a global topology. A sphere-like surface becomes another sphere-like surface. A disk surface becomes another disk-like surface. A donut becomes a donut-like shape, and so forth. Right? Um, we also talked a lot about the differential. So the important geometric picture of the differential is that it pushes forward tangent vectors expressed in the domain into R3. It tells us really how those vectors should look in R3. Again, in terms of exterior calculus, we can say the differential is a R3 value differential one form, which in fact is just the exterior derivative of F, right? The differential is DF. And again, this important geometric idea that DF of X 
stretches out the tangent vector in the plane to get the vector that we, we find actually on the surface. We say that the surface is immersed if df is non-degenerate, if it maps non-zero vectors to non-zero vectors. And this is our regularity condition. This is the condition that says, when is this a nice map? When is this something that is going to let us actually compute further geometric quantities without any trouble? Okay. One of the most fundamental uh, quantities or properties that we want to associate with the surface is its induced Ramanian metric, G, which really is nothing more than something that says how to take the inner product between tangent vectors. It's saying if we have two vectors that are represented in the plane, what is the inner product that corresponds to how they should behave on the surface? Okay. The other really fundamental quantity we associated with the surface was its Gauss map or its unit normal, which we said is a nice continuous map into, well, here I've written it into R3, but importantly, it really maps into the unit sphere sitting in R3. It assigns a unit vector to each point of the domain, right? So we can really think of the Gauss map again as another surface that's sitting as a patch of the sphere rather than a patch in R3, okay? So we really have only scratched the surface here. As we talked about at the beginning of our discussion of surfaces, there's lots of different ways to express the geometry of, of a surface, lots of different mathematical languages that people use. Uh, you can look at it locally by considering a height function over the tangent plane. You can consider a local parameterization, as we did. Um, you can write down what are called the Christoffel symbols, you can, meaning you can use a lot of coordinates in the plane to work things out. This is especially nice if you're trying to do things like analyze partial differential equations. Um, we are going to use, we're going to continue to use differential forms, which are this nice coordinate free way of writing down quantities on surfaces that translates very, very naturally to computation that translates to meshes very well. Um, and another really nice vocabulary for talking about surfaces, which maybe we'll get a chance to talk about is moving frames. So just like our Frenet frame for curves, you can, you can associate an adapted frame to the surface. And looking at how this frame changes tells you a lot about the geometry of the surface itself. Uh, you can talk, if you like complex analysis, another nice local picture is the picture of Riemann surfaces. You can also extend this to a global picture using quaternion valued functions and on and on and on. Over the years, mathematicians have come up with all sorts of different ways of talking about surfaces. And the important thing is to not get it too attached to just one way of doing it. Each different dialect provides additional power. And actually, when it comes to computation, learning to speak these different languages can actually lead to completely different ways to approach algorithms. Right. So the more different languages you speak, the richer your understanding will become. Um, we're only going to really talk in detail about differential forms in this class, but I'll provide some references to further reading on, on the web for those of you who want to learn more. Okay, that's it for now. Next time we'll talk about how to translate a lot of these ideas into the discrete setting.